It is my pleasure to be the chair of this webinar on disability inclusive health system research and fragile in shock prone setting. Uh, this webinar is organized by the Rebuild for Resilience Consortium. And the webinar aims to create a dialogue with different uh, experts working in the field of uh, disability and on health systems that, uh, that, that to understand how the health systems research are to be in putting uh, disability at the front line. So we would like to, uh, firstly, I would like to call upon the first speaker, uh, Joanna Revin, to talk about Rebuild for Resilience and our work. Joe, please. Thank you, um, Choo Choo. Let me just share, you, share with you my slides. Thank you. And so hello and welcome to you all. I'm Joanna Raven. I'm the co-research director for Rebuild for Resilience. Um, and I just want to give you a very brief introduction to the Rebuild for Resilience program to set the scene for this webinar. So we started our new and exciting research program consortium Rebuild for Resilience in May this uh, last year, sorry, 2020. And it's funded by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And it focuses on health systems in fragile contexts, experiencing conflict, pandemics, and other shocks. And the program is for six years, so until 2026. The consortium is led by Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, with partners of the American University of Beirut in, Le in Lebanon, the Burnett Institute in Myanmar, where Chu Chu is based, um, Heard International in Nepal, College of Medicine and Allied Health Sciences in Sierra Leone, the Oxford Policy Management and the Allied Health Science, um, the International Rescue Committee as well. So Rebuild for Resilience builds on the work of the highly successful COVID funded Rebuild program, which fo focused on health systems in post-conflict settings, becoming a lead leading global research team and reference point for policymakers and academics. But unfortunately, you know, the challenges continue. There are 2 billion people live in fragile and conflict affected settings. The share of extreme poor living in these settings is rising, fueled by growing inequality, conflicts and other shocks. And we're working in these complex fragile environments where challenges include severe resource constraints, multiple shocks and stresses, weak institutions and absence of reliable routine data. So in these contexts, our aim is to generate credible and timely evidence which not only speaks to local challenges, but also supports wider potential solutions. Our vision is to help build health systems which are resilient to shocks and stresses, able to deliver responsive, effective, inclusive and gender equitable services that are of quality and leave no one behind. So we're in the first year of the programme and developing our research for the entire programme. So we want to make sure that our research really addresses the needs of people with disabilities. So I, and I'm sure you are all too, looking forward to hearing from these experts about their experiences, their learning and their recommendations research on this often, very often neglected area. So back to you, Chu Chu to hear from all of these other other people and I'm really delighted that you could all come and and help us with our research. Thank you. Thank you so much Joe for giving a brief on Rebuild for Resilience Consultia and um, I would like to welcome all the speakers on behalf of the Rebuild for Resilience Consultia. Uh, that are, I would like to invite our next speaker Hannah Hannah is the Professor of Epidemiology and Director of International Center for Evidence and Disability from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So I would like to invite Hannah to share her experiences on disability inclusive health systems. Hannah, please. So 
So thank you very much um, for the introduction and for inviting me on this webinar. And I'm going to provide a bit of a background framework talking about the importance of disability inclusive health systems to help frame the discussions where others will focus more on fragile and conflict post-conflict settings. I'm at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine um, with the International Centre for Evidence in Disability, but I'm also part of the Missing Billion Consortium, which has been focusing a lot on access to healthcare and disability inclusive health systems. So I'm drawing on some of the work here. The first thing to say is that globally 15% of the world's population has a disability. So that's one in seven people globally. And that people with disabilities are often left behind in a variety of settings. They're more likely to be poor. They're more likely to be excluded from education and employment and um, receive negative attitudes. So we're already thinking about a framework of vulnerability. And set against that, people with disabilities often have both greater healthcare needs but also more difficulties accessing healthcare services. So briefly, there are three types of health needs um, that people with disabilities uh, may have in particular. The first is that on average, people with disabilities that have a higher vulnerability to poor health. So uh, on average, they might have more risk factors, both distal risk factors like poverty and aging, but also things like living in um, poor, poor environments, um, obesity and so or the chronic malnutrition and so on. Um, they will also by definition have an impairment in a health condition which also increase the vulnerability to poor health. So for that reason also because people everybody has regular health care needs on on average people with disabilities will have a greater requirement for regular health care general health care. Additionally, many people with disabilities can benefit from specialized medical treatment or rehabilitation services, so assistive technology, physiotherapy, and so on. So there will also be the need for those services and their very great gaps in provision, particularly in low middle income settings, particularly in conflict settings. So what you have on average is people with disabilities requiring more healthcare services, but facing lots of barriers. And when we think about barriers, we often think about things like attitudinal barriers, physical barriers, informational barriers. But we've tried to think about this in a slightly different way. So first of all, people may experience barriers across the healthcare seeking journey. So from when they realize that they have a health condition to deciding to seek healthcare, going to the venue, having service, engaging with staff and having follow-up treatment. So we think about access to services, it's that whole spectrum and then it's across the whole spectrum of services as laid out in UHC from promotive through to rehabilitation and palliative. From the demand side, so from the perspective of the person with people with disabilities, um, there may be gaps in autonomy and awareness or affordability, which makes it more difficult to access services. And then from the healthcare supply side, there can be problems with lack of healthcare providers, lack of their knowledge and attitudes towards disability and lack of capacity, which also creates barriers to people with disabilities accessing health services. But those barriers don't come from nowhere. They come from system level failures. So from lack of data and evidence, lack of legislation and policy to protect the rights of people with disabilities or to enforce those rights, lack of financing and funding and lack of leadership. So we put together this framework to think in a more holistic way about barriers, which helps to inform how we can start to tackle those barriers. So because people with disabilities on average have got greater healthcare needs yet face more barriers, on average they have worse outcomes across the whole spectrum. So people with disabilities, for instance, if we look across all the SDG3 targets, are three times more likely to have diabetes, two times more likely to have malnutrition, 50% more likely to experience catastrophic health expenditure, to two times more likely to have HIV. They're 10 times more likely to be seriously ill as a child. And overall, this contributes to a two to three higher level of mortality, where most of the data coming from Africa, um, and that is across the life. So we see very poor health outcomes for people with disabilities. And if we turn to fragile settings, which is the focus here, we see this as well. So from our work, our group has worked among Syrian refugees in Istanbul, where although it was a young population, a quarter had disabilities, and those 
Many people faced high levels of need for specialist services, which were largely unmet, and the people with disabilities were 4.5 times more likely to report a serious health problem. In our work uh, in Tanzania and in the Ukraine, we showed how older people with disabilities living who, um, in those fragile post-conflict settings were often excluded from the humanitarian response. And in our work in Turkana and Kenya, we saw that again, which was specifically about famine relief, where the famine relief was provided through schools, but many children with disabilities were not going to schools and so were excluded. And COVID is a case in point here. Um, so just to emphasize the vulnerability, in the, in, in the UK population, 16% of, of people have disabilities, but people with disabilities were 59% of the COVID-19 deaths. So this is just a way of illustrating that in um, extreme settings such as COVID-19 or uh, fragile states, people with disabilities are highly, highly vulnerable. And this really matters. So it matters that we're excluding people with disabilities from healthcare responses in terms of health goals. It matters to individuals that people need good healthcare to maximize their quality of life. The right to health is enshrined in international law, including for people with disabilities. So we're not complying with those laws if we exclude people with disabilities. And good health is necessary for the achievement of other SDG goals like employment and education. So if we fail to maximize health, we fail to maximize other SDGs. And there's also very good evidence that if we um, design a healthcare system that caters to the need of more vulnerable people, um, it'll be a better healthcare system for all. So if we think in these fragile states, how to make healthcare sy systems that work for disabled people, they will work for other groups as well. And so to do that, we need to go back to what the barriers are and develop solutions that tackle those barriers and obviously that are appropriate to different settings. Um, and so this is a kind of an area of work of ours at the moment, both with the Missing Billion Project and with our broader work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as to how can we measure where the gaps are in the health system for people with disabilities and how can we develop and implement appropriate solutions, including in post-conflict and fragile settings. So thank you very much. Uh, this was a little bit of a whirlwind tour. So if there's anyone wanting more information, please do contact me either on my email address, which is given here, or through our Missing Billion website. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Hannah, for a very interesting presentation and keeping with it with time. Thank you so much, Hannah. So uh, with due regard, I would like to uh, kindly invite the next speaker, Nukbak Zia from John Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health from USA. Uh, uh, Nukbak, please. So thank you so much to the speakers um, and uh, thank you so much to the Rebuild Consortium for the invite. I am uh, presenting the John Topkins International Injury Research Unit and the Relap Consortium. And I'll be sharing our work on uh, measurement of child disability in Uganda. Before I get into the, the standing on uh, the work that we had done in Uganda, I would like to appreciate that disability is a complex and uh, very um, uh, dynamic phenomena to assess. And we looked at this from, and we can appreciate the issues around disability by looking at this framework that was put forward by the WHO in 2001. This ICF framework really helps us to think about disability, not only from the health condition perspective, but also from the ability of a person to perform within their work environment, and also looking at the contextual factors. When we talk about disability in children specifically, we cannot merely think of them as little adults. We need to think about not only the dynamic and the complex process related to disability, but also look at the, their growth and development needs. So to address this gap in measuring disability among children, the Washington Group on Disability Statistics and UNICEF contributed and developed um, a child functioning module based on the ICF framework. The module basically looks at a wide age range, and we implemented this module focusing on children between 5 to 17 years of age in Uganda. 
This work was basically um, a continuation of our work on disability assessments in adults. We implemented this tool at the Ganga Mayuge Health and Demographic Surveillance Site, which is located in Eastern Uganda. The site is a very good resource in terms of um, collecting data at census level from over 18,000 households. And it includes about five to, uh, 30, 40% of children between five to 17 years of age, which was the target group for our work. With the help of the support that we had from the site, we were able to embed the data collection uh, to, into their regular functions. And as a result of that, not only were we able to collect the child functioning related data, we also collected contextual factors around birth history, vaccination history, um, factors related to caregiving, and also access to school, medical care, and rehabilitation. In order to categorize disability, we basically um, looked through several different ways of defining disability. And this table here is um, uh, showing you the different categories that we were able to work through. So we had mild, moderate, and severe categories. These categories are important to consider when we talk about fragile settings, because one of the main things that we need to think about is that how the data from disability assessments can be used towards decision making around allocation of resources. So the three things that I want to talk about with respect to this work and how this can be linked with fragile settings include number one, understanding around disability categories. So when we looked at our data, we found that over 65% of the children had mild, moderate, or severe disability. But if we look at just the moderate and severe categories, we found that we had 20% of the children with either moderate or severe disability. This becomes important when we have limited resources. So when I'm talking about children with mild disability, the numbers are larger. So if I have to allocate my resources, should I be focusing on children with mild disability? Because the impact would be shown in terms of the greater number that we are able to impact. But if we want to look at or contribute towards moderate and severe um, uh, disability and have interventions focused on that, we'll be able to make an impact on, more on the quality of life of children with uh, moderate to severe disability. The second thing that I want to discuss is contextual factors, which is very important, especially in fragile settings because of the fluidity of the environment. We looked at several different uh, contextual factors and uh, the ones that I'm presenting here is immunization status and uh, school enrollment. And we found that both of these were really low for children who have severe disability which is concerning when we talk about fragile settings because these are likely to be the disadvantaged ones and it puts these children at a lot more vulnerability compared to children who do not have disability. The third thing with respect to disability research in children is the respondent type. We want to see that which respondent should we be catering to? Should we reach out to the caregivers of children or should we talk to the children themselves? In our work, we talked to the children and we were able to see that the responses between the children and their caregiver had really good agreement. And from a fragile state perspective, it becomes important because sometimes children do not have their caregivers with them. So we don't want these children to be excluded from the data and to understand their needs around disability. So basically, as uh, Hannah also mentioned, that some of the systems level factors is basically lack of data and evidence. So it's very important that we're able to have timely available data, which is reliable, to not only understand the needs within these settings, but also be able to develop, implement, and monitor interventions in these settings. We have tools both for children and adults that can easily be administered in community settings, and these do not require prior clinical training. It is also important to note that most of these tools can easily be embedded within the data collection mechanisms that these sites use. These are self-reported tools, however, therefore sometimes we also need to think about clinical follow-ups to make sure that our interventions are working. In addition to the work that we do around disabilities, uh, most of our work focuses also on health systems and thinking about how best we can integrate rehabilitation using different um, approaches around implementation sciences. 
So um, we have uh, recently formed a consortium around uh, um, rehabilitation in health systems, and we look forward to interacting with you and developing future collaborations and discussions on how we think about disability in fragile settings and how we can start conversations around integrating rehabilitation within these health systems. And I'm happy to connect with you via my email, and also please connect with us on our Twitter chat and through our websites. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Nubak, for a very interesting uh, talk, especially on childhood disability and some of the disability work that has been done. So thank you so much. And uh, the next speaker is Alcher from International Committee of the Red Cross in Lebanon. Could I invite Alcher to start your talk? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So. My name is Aisha Benyesh. I'm uh, currently based in Lebanon. So I will share my presentation uh, before uh, starting. Um, yes. One second. Voilà. So, um, Thank you for uh, this uh, opportunity to share our experience from the International Committee of the Red Cross um, in Lebanon. So first, I would like to also emphasize on the project that we are currently on doing related to the health system strengthening, which is for assistive technology, where we started a benchmarking study that I will explain a little bit more during the presentation. Uh, but first of all, a small word about the International Committee of Red Cross. Uh, what is the International Committee of Red Cross or the ACRC? The ACRC was uh, it's an institution that was initiated in 1863. And the work is based on the principle of the Geneva Convention for the protection of the weapon wounded in war context or conflict zone. So one of the main challenge uh, related to this, the Convention of uh, Geneva that the, the, the lack of access to physical rehabilitation for the weapon wounded or injured uh, individual due to the war or the situation of context of violence. And it constitutes one of the major challenge and uh, important gap. So since 1917, uh, CRC decided to go and to help people with physical disability. And it was a large commitment that since today, since this time into today, where ACRC is engaged in various countries, where today we can say that 30 uh, physical rehabilitation centers worldwide are uh, providing prosthetic orthotics, uh, wheelchair, and physiotherapy for the people with physical disability. Um, so, um, Back as well to um, see here, you can see that in 1979, so that's one of the first projects at the global level worldwide. It started inside uh, during the civil war, where the SRC trains uh, a group of 10 individuals to become expert in, in Lebanon. And today we can see that uh, we have this is that we continue today since the crisis, the regional crisis with the Syrian conflict, where uh, we came back since 2014 and we assisted more than 4,000 individuals from every communities, including Lebanese community. Going to the stories of Lebanon, um, I would like to share the story of Ali, who is a landmine survivor, a Lebanese who, um, who uh, was injured by a landmine and gets um, a double amputations. And the um, starting point was uh, when discussing with Ali, uh, what are the reasons that he faced so many difficulties to access to assistive technology, to the, his prosthesis, and to renew them, because in renew, he needs to renew like every three to five years. So it was one of the question mark, what is the lack, what is the reason uh, to access to the rehabilitation, and to, more specifically to also prosthetics in Lebanon. So a word about um, the disability um, statistic in Lebanon. Uh, before the Syrian conflict, it was estimated there is between two to 10% of people with disability living in the country, with more than half of percentage of them with a physical impairment or physical mobility. Um, then most of them were uh, more near uh, the cause of civil uh, war with weapon wounded 
also with a lot of cases with chronic disease and aging populations. Since the regional crisis, um, of course, it increased a high load of a uh, number of individuals who have also um, a trauma condition due to weapons and, and, uh, and the context of war in Syria. But as well, we have seen also the challenge in some of our beneficiaries or patients that um, a second generation of children uh, from the Syrian community due to a forearm limited access for maternal care who have children and high number of children with cerebral palsy or musculoskeletal conditions and, and, uh, and then not uh, proper uh, follow-up or care to uh, decrease the risk of, of further disabilities. And also in the refugees, there's uh, the community of Palestinians also facing other great challenges uh, in terms of uh, disability conditions with a lot of cases of hypertension, diabetes, leading to amputation and specifically for this time um, on this difficult condition with the pandemic. So to add those uh, in terms of burdens, so uh, Lebanon was also um, facing a great challenge in, uh, since the end of the last year with an important economic crisis where uh, the individuals um, could not access to healthcare or with a limited uh, access to a orthotic or prosthetic as because Lebanon import many all the materials to manufacture them. And, uh, and with the lack of access to, to the deviations and we couldn't import materials. So today the situation is that with the pandemic, it's also even increasing um, that most of uh, the people with disability are many discriminated. So in terms of accessing and as well also having additional challenge to, to continue to access for uh, rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation as well. As you may heard or know, the last uh, <clears throat> event, we also continue to increase another layer in study explosion that occurred on the 4th August, where um, 200, 200 individuals, unfortunately, were um, killed during these explosions and where 6,000 of individuals were injured, leaving behind a high number of people with disabilities, so adding another layer of challenges for Lebanon to cope with those um, protracted crises and with um, a long-term effect and impact on the populations. So with all this effect and all this uh, information, we, haven't decided, we have decided to focus on certain needs and to understand what are the strategy, what is also needed to develop more, um, how to increase access to prosthetic and orthotics from, from, for the people who may need um, for the device. So we decided to um, conduct a benchmarking statement uh, against the 60 standards that were developed by the WHO. And those uh, 60 standards are part of the um, part of the high overall package for the universal health coverage, where it's specifically uh, on, uh, emphasizing on the different part of like the policy, the project and personal and provision related to the standard for prosthetic and orthotics. So since uh, 2020, we have been started this work with, um, in partnership with the Ministry of Public Health and the University of Balamant with the support of consultant from UK on how to benchmark every single standard with the current situation in Lebanon. So, um, and it shows that there is various um, issue that need for range of improvement and, and developing a vision and policy framework. So many and one of the conditions, for example, so we see that many policies and guidelines were not up to date since 1997, where you have many, the technology has evolved since that time, where there's like less, um, um, where there's more need and the disability uh, condition are also changing since this time. Um, so the situation analysis also um, highlights one important challenge that we notice also in many countries where we are used to work is also the lack of awareness from the population on the need of the people with physical disability in terms of assistive technology. So it's one of the main issues that also even the people, group, the group of population where also the concerned uh, individuals are also themselves not aware about the rights or aware about where to get access. So it's also something that that we, um, we are working on uh, with the Ministry of Health on how to uh, develop a strategic planning. So related also to this problematic related to multi-sectorial 
issues. So that need to be a cross line on between every ministries or every uh, organizations that to need to promote the access and also how to make sure that that there is more awareness about the need of people with physical, physical disability for prosthetic and orthotic services. So by the end of 2020, um, 2020, the benchmark statement is almost finalized and uh, will be published soon and for um, further developments with um, the different stakeholders uh, on how to increase the access for the prosthetic and orthotic services in Lebanon. Thank you. So, um, well, it's covered. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Acha, for another a different aspect of the disability and very interesting work in Lebanon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you I much. would like to call upon the next speaker, Deepak, the executive director of Varuna Foundation in Nepal. Uh, I would like to request the speaker, as our time is very limited, to stick to the time of five minutes, please, Deepak. Thank you, everybody. Greetings from Nepal. I'm going to talk about the state of uh, disability in Nepal and a major intervention that Corona is making together with uh, provincial government of Nepal. You know, the, when we talk about disability, you know, many people here in Nepal, they believe disability is only a social issues, but uh, in our work, we believe and we, we act, it is an economic and political issues too. So considering all these three social, economic and uh, political aspects, in low and middle income countries, children and adults with disabilities are always neglected, excluded, and there is no effective mechanism to operationalize the UNCRPD and many other national provisions at local level specifically and other levels too. And it's still high occurrence of easily preventable birth defects and childhood disabilities, despite of having very strong maternal child health programs in Nepal and many other countries. So when we talk about uh, the status of uh, people with disabilities in Nepal, according to the census 2011, 1.94% people are living with disabilities and Nepal has categorized disabilities into 10 different types. I know the definition of disabilities and pers perspective that we see towards this issue makes the number, uh, you know, the, the number differences. When we identify a person with disabilities, we, we, build, we, we have realized that almost 70% of people need immediate uh, interventions. We also have realized that con condition can be improved significantly if early interventions are made. But unfortunately, they hardly get interventions simply because they are poor the lack of medical facilities and services nearby, long duration of treatment, severity, disaster situation, geography, and many more. We also have serious problem of proper assisted, assistive devices in our country. So altogether, the issue is still hidden, not recognized and accepted. What Corona together with provincial and municipal governments would like to see is to have healthy babies and young children, children with disabilities improved quality of life by having strong self-governing community, com communities who take responsibility of care and inclusion and who are able to further prosper. Our solution in a way, you know, we have uh, piloted a program called Inspire to Care, which is now known as Disability Prevention and Rehabilitation Program in province number one that address that deals with maternal child health care services and community based rehabilitation rehabilitation services by strengthening local communities, where we would like to see effective and learning grassroots organizations. And when we talk about organization, we really need to know that we need to have good people over there. We also would like to see this uh, model uh, prosper as a business model, as a business with business principles. For example, in our case, the cost, the total program cost has been shared one third equally by provincial government, local government and, and Karuna. And we are very clear that there has to be a very clear timeline of, of, of the project. So exit we are talking about. And in three years, we exit from the project area and the government will continue this project. We also believe strongly leave no one behind when we get into a certain geography. 
and we make sure every child with a disability, every adult with a disability, and every pregnant woman are counted and provided services. So in case of impact, we would like to see 70% improved experience in holistic quality of life of children and adults with disabilities, 60% decreases in birth defects and childhood disabilities. We also, sorry, we also would like to have the positive change in, in attitude and inclusive communities and local system will continue the program as they are strengthened and capacitated. There are a couple of track records that uh, justify the, the model that we have been practiced here in Nepal, a research uh, carry, carried out by KIT, the Rural Tropical Institute, shown highly cost-effective interventions using WHO benchmark. And there are a couple of other international recognitions made to the program. So this is my last slide. And what we wish and need is, you know, we do have a kind of uh, proven model in Nepalese context that is disability prevention and rehabilitation, shortly known as DPRP. We are replicating it in one fifth of the geography of Nepal, reaching, uh, covering the whole province of uh, province number one of Nepal, which has almost uh, 5 million millions population by Corona Nepal, together with province and municipalities. We also would like to see this replication in other part of the country, as well as other, other, other geographies. We are implementing it uh, together with a uh, couple of financial and technical partners. We are eager. We also would like, you know, this replication happens with eager and learning local organizations from different parts of the countries and beyond. And we also want funders who are looking for high impact cost effective model and want to support DPRP replication in, in other contexts. So thank you very much Revealed uh, team for this opportunity. And a child with disability can change the community, but it takes a community to raise this child. So with this philosophy, we are moving ahead. And then it's, it was really uh, impressive uh, moment for us to, to share and to, to share our experiences with you and to learn from you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepak, for uh very interesting uh, community-based uh, program involving disability and also looking at sustainability issues on how to deal with disability people within the community. So thank you so much, Deepak. Our next speaker would be Laura Dean from Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, UK. So I would like to invite Laura to share her experiences also. Um, Chi Chu, and thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, hopefully you can see my screen okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some learning from uh, research across West Africa, mainly Liberia, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone, um, which has been aimed at understanding mechanisms that can shape interactions between health deprivations and mainly chronic illness or disease, disability, and mental health conditions. Um, and our work recognizes that not everyone's experiences are the same, and it draws on intersectional and syndemic theory to think about how identity-based characteristics, such as age or gender, interact with broader social and structural determinants to shape harmful conditions for people with lived experience. And what I'll talk mostly about today are some learnings from our work in Liberia re related to neglected tropical diseases, to emphasize how understanding the biosocial connections between health deprivations and disability is essential in ensuring person-centered development and in creating socially just health systems. So the links between neglected tropical diseases as a health deprivation, psychological distress and associated disability are increasingly recognized globally, but these been, have been largely documented from a medical perspective. And so over the last six years, we've worked closely with people with lived experiences of NTDs in Liberia and Nigeria to support the development of a detailed understanding of mechanisms that shape lived experience so that we can develop multidisciplinary health systems interventions that can support the mainstreaming of disability. And these interventions are currently being adapted and piloted through our redress and countdown programs. And you can look more on our websites and Twitter around um, the work that we're doing there. 
I don't have time today to present in detail all of our data, um, but I did want to just share with you this slide, which presents an adaptation of Mender Hall's model for syndemic approaches to health. And it shows um, evidence of a syndemic relationship between neglected tropical diseases and associated impairment, mental distress and disability in a context of, of structural violence within Liberia. And what this diagram aims to show is that there's multiple multi-level pathways that shape vulnerability to neglected tropical disease infection um, for people with disability and others. And then that interacts with disability and mental distress in ways that, that reinforce each other. So if we start at the top, we can see that the post-conflict environment in Liberia often presents multiple generalized stresses, such as precarious livelihoods, food insecurity, poor water and sanitation and weak health systems that may contribute to periods of mental distress amongst the general population. And the same stresses also present a risk environment for experience of chronic morbidity and disability resultant from NTDs. And for people affected by NTDs who I argue have a minority status due to their experiences of disadvantage, these generalized stresses can often become exacerbated. But the degree of this exacerbation is dependent on the impact of intersecting power relations such as gender, age, generation and geography. And these can shape individual and identity and resilience to shape experiences of disability. The mutually reinforcing interactions between somatic experience, so pain and functional limitation, ability to complete daily activities and the social meaning of disease also shape experience. And for example, varying processes of stigmatization and discrimination can become additive to general stresses to produce excess risk of mental ill health amongst people affected by NTDs and disability, which is a result of social stress um, resulting from structural inequities. So what does this mean for health systems responses to health deprivations and its complex interplay with disability? I would argue that the social world cannot be disconnected from lived experiences and health systems must be able to respond to both the social and psychological dimensions of people's lives to successfully mainstream disability. By using a syndemic framework to consider how social and structural stresses shape impacts on health and experiences of health deprivations, multi-sectoral responses to support the health and well-being of people with disability can be developed. As I've tried to show in this very short case study, and hopefully we can talk more about it in the question and answer session, in fragile and conflict affected states, intervening to transform the social, environmental or political factors that contribute towards the interactions between health conditions is essential in minimizing burdens of ill health amongst people with disability. And person-centered approaches within health systems that are grounded in syndemic understandings of disease and illness can provide an optimal framework for informing the type of multi-level responses that are required to mainstream considerations of disability within health systems. So I would argue that alignment of disability mainstreaming efforts to the development of people-centered health systems could be beneficial in promoting action and change. And putting people and their values at the center of health intervention design is a key underlying principle for people-centered health systems. And I just wanted to emphasize that the understandings presented today have been largely documented through the use of participatory longitudinal methodologies with people with disability. And this is centered around the engagement of people with disability and disabled persons organizations as peer researchers within the research process. And these are um, processes that we're exploring further within the ARISE Hub as well. So do, do look at our website and Twitter to understand more about that. And these processes of co-production focus on building trust and are directed by people with lived experiences. Co-production with people with disability becomes critical to unlocking solutions to the everyday complexities and prioritizing disability inclusion within health systems design. And I would stress that participatory and narrative research methodologies that bring people with lived experiences together with other health system stakeholders to shape collective action and improve the inclusivity of health systems design is critical as we move forwards to put people and compassion at the center of health systems. And hopefully we can discuss more of these in the question and answer session. So thank you and please do reach out if you want any further information about any of our work. Thank you so much, for Laura, for touching a very important area on 
metadata, tropical disease and disability, and looking at some of the ways that research can be done involving disability persons in our health systems. So um, I would like to call upon uh, our last speaker, an activist, a scholar, data fest, an honorary research fellow from LSTM. I would like to respect, respectfully call Janet Price to share her experience. Janet, please. Hello, I'm sorry I was a little late joining the session this morning. Um, I've got terrible trembles today, so I'm having real difficulties managing my computer. So um, please excuse me for that. Um, yes, my name's Janet Price. I'm um, a white woman wearing dark glasses. I've got graying hair, um, quite a thin face, and I'm wearing a, a green jumper. And behind me, I've got a mess from my father's studio of um, computers and um, shelves of CDs and there's a big lamp leaning over my corner, over my shoulder. Um, I wanted to talk today really about experiences from an activist experience as a disabled person and working very closely with other disabled activists in countries such as India, the Cameroons, Malawi, countries which are facing enormous problems at this time of COVID in somewhere like Cameroon have over the last five years been facing times of conflict and war, but where disabled people and particularly women with disabilities have been managing to maintain um, an activist presence to support other disabled people around them. And what I wanted to do was to think about health from the perspective of the home and disabled people who are in many contexts, contexts limited to the home, that they are relatively immobile and get very little opportunity to um, move outside that space. And the types of issues that that can present for them um, within a family where there is a re really no desire for that disabled people to disabled person to be present, they can face enormous isolation. Stories from the Cameroon of people being put in the animal shed while they were growing up, um, being thrown scraps of food, but having very little more than that. Basically, because families see little purpose in investing them in in disabled people, many disabled people. So they won't invest um, in their education, in their care and support. Um, if they do get access to the communities, there is there are very often um, high levels of stigma that people face. There's been a massive increase in the domestic violence that's being faced within the home as a result of COVID. And that's presenting enormous problems to people um, inevitably because there are very few resources that a disabled person can turn to for external support. And I think this is where the role of activist organizations becomes so important because they are there um, to work primarily as an advocate for a disabled person, but hopefully to link in with organisations such as the health service. Now, I was talking to a friend in Cameroon yesterday, and she was saying that one of the challenges there is that within the health service, they are just people in the community who have grown up with the same prejudices around disability as people in families have who aren't investing in, in their disabled members. So if a disabled person does manage to get to a health service, they can be met again with the same levels of disrespect and stigma um, and often brutality. Um, if women are pregnant, they face very difficult experiences because um, little help to move them around. Why did you want to get pregnant? You know, you shouldn't be bringing yet another um, disabled person into the world. A complete lack of understanding. 
So what organisations like the Cameroonian one, the Northwest Women with Disabilities Support Organisation, Rising Flame in India doing, are a number of things. I think, first of all, they are collecting stories. They are talking to people about what is happening in their lives. And in that, those conversations, people's isolation is lessened. They become much more a part of something if they're able to be deeply involved within those conversations about the experience of their life and how they would like to change them. So I think stories for me comes first and foremost. Um, I think following on from stories um, are a number of things. I think one, another, another issue is friendship and intimacy. Often there is a deep isolation for disabled people growing up. And again, organisations of people with disabilities can offer friendship, they can offer support. Um, they can just offer a recognition from other people that you are not the only person facing disability. And I'm talking right across the range from um, people with mobility impairments through to people with severe psychological psychosocial problem. I have seen all of these groups of people through activism, through involvement in groups, blossom. So I think that's a crucial issue. I'm afraid I'm completely unaware of my timing here. So could somebody tell me when I'm getting close to being? How am I doing? Uh, I think you only have like one minute left. Okay, that's fine. Um, so I want you to think about intimacy, support, connection, talking to disabled people as though they are real people and the ways in which this doesn't happen in communities and that the health service, close to community workers particularly, have an enormous role to play in actually crossing some of those divides, enabling people to see that disabled people are actually a productive, constructive part of the community. I mean, for example, Ruth from Cameroon was telling me about three women she'd blind, who she'd encouraged to go and get education. So they managed to get through their final high school education. Then they fought on and they managed to do a, a degree in journalism. So now they're fully qualified journalists, but nobody will employ them because they are blind. So Ruth is now saying, well, set up your own radio station. So then the next step is, where does the computer come from? So there's always these lines of steps, but it's that continuing inspiration that keeps Ruth going and keeps these women going. This list of possibilities. And I think that breaking of isolation, that breaking of those psychosocial um, challenges that people face through being treated as though they are worthless for much of their lives or even just for being you know pushed to one side in the queue there's a whole series even if there's a broader acceptance in the family so I think this constant lack of recognition of the place within the community the health service health workers have an enormously important role in saying disabled people are a part of our community and they have a vital role to play sorry for the lack of powerpoints you just got my face but thank you very much thank you so much Annette this was very fruitful looking uh, listening from a perspective of a activist uh, I call it a more uh, advocate so thank you so much, Janet, for that. So uh, we will be going into the panel discussion with all our eminent uh, speakers. And um, I would like to uh, just to uh, uh, talk about the panel discussion. So we will be having about 10 minutes each of three rounds of questions. And um, I would like to uh, request the participant to uh, put their questions in the Q&A uh, area of the Zoom, Zoom instead of the chat box because we will be looking at the Q&A area of the uh, section in the Zoom. So please uh, raise your question in the Q&A box. Okay, so um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Janet, Laura, uh, Acha and Deepak and I don't, uh, is Deepak also here? I didn't see Deepak yet. Is he still around? 
Thank you, Deepak, yes. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for a very interesting and very uh, different perspective on disability, which I did learn a lot uh, as a health system person. And I really learned so much from you all, listening to you all. So uh, I would like to start the panel uh, with the very first question uh, is that, why is work on disability and health system so often siloed uh, instead of having an inclusive system? Anyone would like to start? I, I can jump in if yes, no one else please. wants to. Um, I think uh, two things that I would raise is I think disability often is seen as a, a cross-cutting issue. And so people within a health system, there's no kind of one section that takes responsibility or um, where there are specific dedicated um, people working on these issues, they're often under-resourced and competing against much larger issues or programs for resources. So I think that, that that's a reason even within health systems research why, where, why disability can, can often be a bit sidelined or, or siloed. Um, so I, I won't talk too much. I'll give other people a chance to. Um, I can jump in and I, um, I apologize for all the sound system issues initially. So I hope you can hear me now. Um, so I think from the perspective of siloed um, uh, impact, when we talk about disability and health systems, one of the things, Laura, I'm gonna build on your point of limited resources is also um, lack of data. And the data that we have is very patchy. There has been work that's done in Syria and Jordan and Lebanon, for example, and also now coming from Nepal. It's important that, the, that we have evidence and we have um, data that talks about the needs of individuals with disability. And not only that, but also looking into what those needs are and how those can be provided. So also looking at the evidence at the health systems level, that what is how well prepared the system is. Because usually with when we talk about fragile settings and conflict settings, the burden falls on the host health systems then and because they're already burdened it kind of like becomes difficult for them to understand the need and to allocate resources so um, i think i'm going to advocate for having data and evidence that not only talks about the individuals but also the resources available at the systems level thanks um, um could i go in go ahead janet i can okay um well, I, I wanted to, um, hang on, am I, which way are we doing it? You're am I okay with it? Yeah, you okay. Um, all right. I, I wanted to say, I think that one of the things that we have to acknowledge many fragile systems contacts, there's a whole colonial history to the way that health services have grown and developed to the way institutionalization of very large groups of um, particular types of disabled people has happened. So people with leprosy, for example, people with psychosocial health problems. Um, and I think one of the issues I would like to raise very loudly really is that of psychosocial health which we do have data about we do know about it is a big part of our our understanding of of health and um it just doesn't it doesn't factor in what is going on in provision of care very often it falls out of the bottom so um despite all of the things that happen, I think there still runs through this, a layer of <coughs> lack of interest, of prejudice against particular groups of people in our societies that runs very, very deeply and is gonna take an enormous amount of advocacy, probably of activist work, um, you know, of disrupting of systems to actually get the health services to take real account of the needs of people with disabilities. So, Aicha. Aicha? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I just agree with also with um, other panelists mentions um, lack of resources and lack of data is also important and then when also how the way it is institutionalized, um, how to address also disability based on the um, experience we have with the ICRC and other also humanitarian organizations, we often work in low income countries or contexts where affected by, by violence. So, so one of the things that we also often um, face when working with um, authorities that the disability is um, is pulled in under one specific ministries um, and not included in the other. It's not seen as the um, cross sectional issues. Like for example, I can give the example in Lebanon or in Cambodia. So following the civil war or this context of violence, so that the disability file was like um, given to a specific ministry that not always understand or work with other authorities like um, Ministry of uh, Social Affairs or Ministry of, uh, of Veteran or so and then it's often um, the ministry that with the lowest budget. Um, that's what we also face as an issue and where um, the rehabilitation for, for the disability sector is not seen that integrated into the global perspective or in, into the health system. So a lot of efforts are promoting to, to have more this multi-sectorial approach, but it's still a long way to go. And I think it's also due to a lack of awareness, which is one of the key challenge. And I think data, resources, um, evidence will help a lot on addressing this lack of awareness and understanding. Ipek, would you like to add anything? Uh, thank you, not much, you know, in, in our context, uh, what we see, you know, the disability is the issue, issues of none. You know, when you see the government ministries and the system that has been developed to deal with social yeah. issues, Disabilities are put uh, under the under, underneath, and they are discussing whether this is the issue of Ministry of Social Development or Ministry of Health or Ministry of Education. It it, it does have multi-faceted issues, you know. So, so this is one part. The other part, as we discussed in the data, we do not know what exactly is the status. We do not know where they are, and we do not know what conditions they do have. So, not having data, not knowing where they are, and not knowing the conditions of these people. As you know, it has made the issue more complicated so far, I feel. Yep, thank this you. Is it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, discussion looking at how, how the disability has been siloed in the health system, looking from uh, both policy and also from uh, uh, actual implementation perspective. So I have a few questions that are coming up and I would like to ask uh, the panelists. Uh, the first question was that how to build capacity strengthening uh, that comes as a co-production of evidence-based research, how to build uh, capacity strengthening as a result of the solutions that we do research in with disability people. So the question was that uh, can you share your experience of, on building capacity, building building capacity strengthening within your research works? That was the first question. So I would like to uh, start with that one first. Janet. Well, my my first. And a major comment is this has to be something that involves disabled people from the very start, from the very point that you begin planning. It's no good bringing them in halfway through the, um, the set of ideas and saying, oh, we need to provide some training. Could you do it for us? Or, you know, could you give a lecture? They need to be there to think through ideas with you, to decide what the priorities are and to help you point to things in the right direction. And that includes right across the spectrum. I mean, it may seem a little bit off the point, but I work with a disabled people run arts organization, um, <coughs> DPO, um, and it's called Dada Fest. And it is a 
run by disabled and deaf people. And they run it, they decide what art they will produce, they produce the art, they organize the access, they present it. So I think those whole range of things, you know, and just that very process builds capacity. You know, it builds capacity in them. And interestingly, it builds massive capacity in the people around them who begin to understand disability much more and who begin to see disabled people as real people with real emotions, and real ideas who are part of their community and who have something to contribute. And I think that's really crucial because if you don't regard something as somebody as having worthwhile ideas, then you are not going to include it. So, um, start from there. Thank you so much, Edith. Uh, does anyone would like to add on the capacity strengthening part of it? I think Laura, I would yes. just add a, a couple of things. Um, I think um, just picking up on what Janet's saying as well, and I think it's about as well as including people with disability from the beginning and planning and, and as part of our, if we're thinking about health systems research as part of our research teams, it's about almost moving beyond just participation and making sure that 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 we have really inclusive study designs and that and that their their idea, people's ideas and and um, viewpoints are treated equally and and in relation to capacity strengthening that this is really a two way process, particularly for health systems research, as you know, we have probably more to learn from people with disability about their experiences and, and realities than us kind of um, capacity strengthening the, them around research. And um, some of the things we do in some of our projects is make sure that we have kind of peer researchers, so, so people with disability who are engaged within our investigatory teams um, as co-investigators on grant applications and study design and within um, the work that we're doing. Um, and also kind of as data collectors um, working with, with other researchers as well. And I think the other thing I'd say is about being important around what we value as research methods and often, and I think that links to what, what Janet's saying around creativity and that can tell us a lot about um, health systems if we open our eyes, I guess, to more creative methodologies or things that are kind of less traditional, but perhaps easier for people with specific communication needs to engage with. Uh, thank you. Uh, linking to Laura's, there's another interesting question coming up, is that they are asking the panelists to, uh, one question is that asking the panelists to identify at least two to three key, key interventions and strategies that to involve policy level players into the disability and health system research arena. Can you please identify two to three interventions and strategies, please? Uh, Nubak, please. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, I'm gonna I'm gonna basically base my um, discussion on the points that Janet and Deepak and Laura have raised around how do we engage with different stakeholders basically so i think that's the first and fourth fourth more thing because in our work experience we have noticed that disability is a multi-sectoral issue it cuts across many different sectors it's not just a health issue so especially in working in low and middle income countries where disability is not housed within the ministry of health it becomes really important that we talk to these other ministries and stakeholders at the policy level. And countries who have recognized the need for understanding disability, the need for understanding even rehabilitation, are the ones where the top tier, the policymakers, the decision makers have been able to appreciate the integration of disability within their work. So I think for me, the first and the fourth most thing is to engage with these stakeholders and to bring them together on a table. So bring together the uh, individuals from the policy arena, bring together individuals from health, uh, financing ministry, social development, inclusive development, even education and employment sector, because they all need to sit together and understand each other's language to be able to develop a common framework that can help integrate and think about um, inclusive health systems. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nufak. That's a very important linking like 
coordinating different ministries because it, it's really important to get everyone on board from the beginning. I'm seeing Acha. Do you want to add on anything? Yeah, oh, just uh, I do agree what uh, was said by Nukvas. So it's stakeholder uh, inclusions and uh, on how to also do a lot of advocacy. And, um, and this is the most important thing. And it takes a lot of time. It takes even years as well um, in terms of how uh, to uh, raise awareness about a better understanding also for the disability needs. On the other hand, there is also um, some countries where you can also use as a base for the policy, the UN Convention for the Right of People with Disability, where you have different articles that have as well as a baseline. Some countries find them, some countries ratify them, some countries have other law. So existing uh, policy also may help also to, to move toward those UN conventions for encouraging countries to signing and ratifying them and developing action plans. So it's also one, I mean, it's a strategic um, options that also can help a lot on making most authorities to be more responsible and, and taking in consideration um, all the skills for the right of the, of the people with disability. Yeah. I saw Deepak hand raising, so would you like to add one more thing? And no, I'll, no. I'll skip on what to the next question. Yeah, what we have exper experienced here in, the, in Nepal is, you know, the policymakers, the politicians, you know, many, many people that do not know much more about disability. So awareness among key, key players, for policymakers, politicians is key. So once we did that, you know, our program was resulted, you know, in a very positive manner. The provincial government and all the municipal, uh, local level leaders, you know, they agreed uh, to 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 roll out the program throughout the provinces, and then they also agreed to allocate significant amount of money to to the project, also in, incorporated in their multi years plan. You know, so so my point of view is, you know, we need to create some role models. We need to establish some success so that people can see. But in the meantime, we need to lobby very strongly. We need to educate and aware people so that it can be done. And it I think we have been able to achieve at least something. You know, I cannot say we have done it. We are on the way to make it happen. And, it, and, and we have a strong belief with, with the experiences that we have is yes, it can be done. Thank you so much, Deepak. Uh, I, there are a few questions still left, but I think I will go on to the next main uh, question. And then I think uh, some of the questions can be addressed while we do the second round of the question. Uh, so I would like to uh, ask the panelists, uh, are there any particular challenges working on disability, especially in the fragile and shock prone setting? Uh, uh, would you like to start, Nubak? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, thank you. I think one of the particular challenges that I see is uh, trying to make a decision around addressing acute conditions versus chronic conditions that um, result in disability. And then also thinking about individuals who already have disability and are living in these settings because they that basically increases their vulnerability. So when we talk about fragile settings or natural disasters where like, you know, um, uh, or even conflict zones, what's happening is that these individuals are exposed to um, these acute hazards. And as a result of that, there is um, a tendency for them to have some kind of a limitation, which can be short term or long term. But because of the chaos that entails and is associated with these um, uh, with these uh, situation, it it's it's basically the equity of uh, situation. So a lot of resources and a lot of focus then tends to be on addressing that acute issue. And, it, and because those acute issues tend to linger on the thinking around when and how to start addressing the needs of individuals with disability and how to start thinking about rehabilitation tends to take a longer time. So in thinking about um, addressing these issues, I think one of the most important thing is the framing of our ask framing uh, disability within within the system that's, that's working. So not trying to address a separate thing, not trying to address a siloed approach, but really thinking about what the system is, where the setting is, how the setting is functioning, what type of a conflict we are looking into, and then framing our question that 
is basically able to fit into the jigsaw puzzle, into the chaos that's um, uh, that's and that's happening. Um, the second um, challenge I think is uh, related to that is on mobilization of resources. Um, initially, when um, uh, when 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 we talk about these settings, the 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 resources are mobilized to kind of um, provide them resources around, you know, basic necessities of living. But then also thinking about how those resources, especially the ones towards health, can also think about rehabilitation, for example, for individuals with disability to provide a long term care. It is theoretically possible. But I think in the implementation perspective, it becomes important to understand the context, understand the setting within which we are working, and then trying to mobilize resources that are efficient to address these needs. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nubak. That's a very important uh, perspective of looking at the health system. Yes, uh, anyone would like to add? Uh, did I see Janet's hands yeah. raising? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I, fu I fully agree with the, that whole notion of trying to actually work within a system that's functioning. You, you're not looking to set up a parallel um, setup. You need something where people can move through a system as it runs. So then two things I would say. Firstly, we're talking initially about the disabled people we found. What about the very large numbers of disabled people who we don't even know about? The ones hiding away, the ones who are completely non-mobile, the ones who are paralyzed by fear because of the fragile setting. In Cameroon, many of the disabled women, their homes have been burnt because they were a very early point of target when people were rampaging through villages and they were seen as hate figures in the community so their homes were destroyed they're now hiding hiding in the bushes um so they're very much out of reach of a very fragile health system and they're often left out because people don't have that you know where do you find that extra push to go out into the bushes to find where they are and to bring the services that they may need. So you're really looking in some contexts at quite certainly initially resource intensive um, input to at least make the contact and help people understand what services might be there and available for them and, and to discuss with them how that could be offered. Um, and that brings me back in a sense to the whole question of access, which is not something we've really talked about in very specifically at all. Um, and I think it's so easy to not think about access because the world works if you're a, a, a normatively embodied person. But you really do have to think about how your buildings are set up. And I know this might sound a big ask in a fragile setting, but creating a ramp into a room is something that a standard labourer will be able to do for you very willingly. Um, finding a signer might be much more difficult, somebody who can do sign interpretation, to make sure that you have, as far as possible, not a child relative, but somebody independent who can interpret for um, people who may need it or describe things to people who are blind. It's thinking about with people themselves, how they move through context and what support they need and trying to find the ways of putting it in place. It's expensive. Access done properly is one of the most expensive things that you will be doing, but it's so crucial if you are going to involve disabled people in it. So I'm not going to fudge it over by and say, oh, other things can be done cheaply. You might manage a cheap ramp, but there's very little else you can do cheaply. So really think about what the costs for access are in anything you can do. It can double the costs of stuff. And it's, it's so important that's recognized in putting together bids for funding. Uh, thank you so much, Janet. That's really, really important. So uh, without going to other panelists, I would like to raise one question from the Q&A section that's coming. Uh, it asks, how far does the current global mental health agenda adequately reflect 
psychosocial challenges for persons with disabilities. Uh, so uh, it's talking about mental health. So would Laura, would you like to go into it? Yeah, I can do. I think um, one thing I would say is that um, what the global mental health agenda has done well um, and a lot of global mental health action networks have done well is prioritizing people with lived experiences at, at, at leading those networks and, and shaping those agendas. I think there's obviously room for more inclusion of people with um, particular kind of particularly stigmatized kind of um, psychological disabilities. Um, but I think I think so far, in my opinion, um, it's, it has people with lived experience much more kind of front and center driving those agendas, but I'm not sure if the other panelists have things they'd like to add around that. I would like to allow one more panelist to respond to. Or disagree. To, <laughs> yes. Yeah, Anybody would like to join? Yes, in fact. This is one of the most uh, important and challenging issues that we are facing while uh, going to the communities. Uh, there is a huge dilemma, you know, whether it belongs to the group of disability or not, whether it is uh, uh, an independent issue, health issue or something different. So there are not much expertise, there are not much services available, and there are not much clarity on the scope of work. So that has made uh, the, the work more more challenging so far, I feel. Yep. Thank you so much, Deepak. It's really true that it's 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 a very soft and touching. Uh, sometimes when you look at mental health issues. So, uh, thank you so much, panelists. And I would like to go to the last round of the questions. So, uh, because I am part of the Rebuild for Consultium. So, as a, uh, what would you like to? Uh, a consortium like Rebuild uh, to do differently and what is the be best practice that we should be following to include disability in the health system? Anyone would like to start? What uh, would you like to give, can you give us some suggestions as a consortium on how to, in, in, how to be more inclusive of disability in our health system research? No, I think, uh, thank you for, again, this opportunity. And yeah, I think you have come quite uh, ahead in this issue, is bringing all these kind of experiences together. The, you know, what I would really like to see you guys doing in this to come is to collect best practices that are happening globally. There are so many efforts and uh, initiations taking place globally. So, you know, let's try to identify them and then try to see how these efforts can bring, you know, can give some, some sort of access to move further in, in the sector of disability. So I think this is important job you, need, you can do. And then I think, again, bringing people together like this and sharing experiences can really help. Like, I'm really impressed by what Nufuba is doing in, uh, in, in her work. The Laura and Janet also were very, you know, like uh, precise on how to deal with this kind of issues. You know? So, so, so to, to be specific, there are many practices happening globally. Let's try to capture them. We can, we can support you with a couple of initiations that are happening. It needs to be accepted, you know, we need uh, wider knowledge dissemination to the policymakers and, and uh, political leaders. In case of Nepal, as I said before, they do not know at all about disability. You know, putting them on a wheelchair and making 500 meters uh, push can change the whole, whole scenario. So, so live, life exper life exper experiences and bringing role models uh, of people with disabilities who can tell how things can be done. Yes. This is what I think. Thank you. Uh, Janet? Did, did I chair have something to say? Yes, please. I just know to highlight what Deepak said, um, just based on experience as well, um, health policy or global policy is really key 
we just realized so a successful outcome when we have a person who understands from the highest level who are completely involved in uh, in the disability when themselves have a disability or a relative so it changed completely the game so um, I think yeah so something more um, I mean how to influence politics how to influence policy or how to make a major recommendations on like either on implementing SDG agenda where there's more inclusion, inclusion for disability or UN convention or adapting to different contexts um, so uh, I think like based on evidence and more data, but policy, I think it's a really a key on making drastic changes and positive change. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to jump in there in response, if I may. Yes, um, just to say, yes, I, I, I think both you know, what Deepak and Aisha have said, coming together just is so solid. What I'd, I'd like to add to the whole thing about influence of, of policymakers is um, part of it is, is speaking their language, but also it's part of them giving them a sense of the experience that disabled people are living through. Um, there was a group of young disabled people working together who made a film about their experiences of education and their exclusion from it. That had a massive impact on a group of policymakers looking at issues around education. Um, there were a group of stories collected from people facing psychosocial mental health problems. And again, writing of their experiences of violence in a whole series of different contexts in very, very clear terms. And those were illustrated and made into proper, proper story frames, storybooks, sharing those again with um, policymakers. It, it really has an impact because you're seeing not simply the dry data, it brings it alive as something that has really happened in happening in a person's life. So I think that's very, very important to actually really try and personalize this. Um, what was what was the other thing I was going to say? Right, care workers. Um, we haven't really um, particularly, I think, um, focused on the work that people who support disabled people within families, within communities do, how it's unacknowledged, usually unpaid, um, underappreciated, and incredibly hard, um, and often results in the people doing the care, members of the family, also facing degrees of prejudice and exclusion. So I think one of the things that um, it's important for the consortium to think about alongside that absolutely crucial work with disabled people is to talk to them alongside care workers, um, whoever they may be, the people who pro provide them assistance in their homes and support them, see what you know would help improve their lives what ways it would be possible and just bring them together so they can sit and have an hour or two of moaning. It's enormously important to be able to moan for an hour or two with other people who are complaining about similar issues. It's astonishing what it can do to lighten the load you wear if you bear, if you are actually with people who understand what you're going through. It's the true for disabled people and it will be true for those who are supporting disabled people. And I think, to actually enhance the position of disabled people within society, it's crucial that both of those elements of it, the disabled people and the people alongside assisting them, are brought into the picture. Thank you so much, Janet, and all the panelists, because our, we have a, we, our, our time is bound. Uh, I, will, uh, I think uh, this, this webinar it's a very, very um, productive and uh, not only me, I think all the participants and all the people working on health system research has learned so much from all our panelists and their work in fragile and shock prone settings on disability inclusive health systems. So I really thank Janet, Laura, Asha, Deepak and Nubak 
for their contribution towards this webinar, which is very, very uh, uh, important for persons who are working on the health system. Uh, before coming to an end, I would like, uh, while thanking, I also took some of the major points that when we look at uh, disability inclusive health systems, it is very important to include disability people from the very beginning uh, of the, the, the things that the work that we do within our health system from the very beginning throughout the process and not only looking at only participation, but bringing into decision making and policy making levels along the continuum of health system research is very important. So I think it's very, that's the first step that I learned so much from you all. And the second thing is because disability is cross cutting and often see as a siloed, we must include different facet of different uh, ministries, not only the ministry that is taking uh, tick as working for disability, but we must include all ministry, including health, education, social welfare, and even financing uh, ministries to work on disability and to get into an inclusive health system for disability. That's a very important issue. And the third thing is very important, lack of data. So like uh, you all have said that, uh, there are very, there are still invisible disability persons for various reasons, both in many, many of the are fragile and shock prone setting due to various reasons. So uh, data on uh, disability within the health system is very in important. Uh, and I, I really acknowledge that. And uh, mobility, mo uh, resource mobilization is also another very important area. And I do see a lot of the health system framework put into disability framework that you are you all are working because the webinar is so short that I do feel that as a consultant member, we do need to learn more from all of you. And I really thank you all for a very productive and very, uh, I think that this webinar was very energetic. Um, I would like to apologize for some of the question and answer. There are a few questions left that we need to be answering, but due to the bounding of time, we were not able to answer uh, what, uh, a few questions. So I would like to request the panelists that we will be sending you some of the questions. If, if you could help us uh, answering some of the questions, we would send them online. I think that would be a good thing. So I really like to thank all the panelists for this uh, webinar and for all your work and all your uh, success in working on disability inclusive health system. And as a Rebuild Consortium, we would like to be learning from you more and more. Thank you very much.